Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Jane Jacobs Lecture Series from the Center for the Living City and Marywood University School of Architecture. This lecture is also being coordinated by Island Press. We are so proud to have Richard Ryan with us today. And he will be talking about how William H. White's unconventional wisdom reshaped public life based on his new book, The American Urbanist. The American Urbanist has been um, released in January to rave reviews. The New York Times calls it a marvelous new biography. And there's a wonderful review by Richard Florida where he says, Richard Ryan's American Urbanist is a must read book, not just for those who care about building better cities, but for anyone and everyone who cares about more effective companies and creative organizations. Through Ryan's detailed telling, Holly White emerges as among the most important urbanists and even more so as one of the most important public intellectuals of our time shaping the discourse about economy and society, cities and management, innovation and creativity over the course of the late 20th, 21st centuries. The reviews are endless and they are also positive and we are so grateful to have Richard with us. Richard is um, after reporting, after a re reporting career, as a reporter <laughs> that included stops at Time Magazine and People, Richard Ryan launched a nationally acclaimed weekly newspaper, US One, that helped the Princeton Route One corridor become more than an edge city. Ryan now serves on Princeton Future, a nonprofit that promotes sustainable urbanism in his hometown. Richard, welcome. And thank you so very much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Maria. And let me uh, go through the, the the formalities here of the uh, <laughs> shared screen and so on. I think I'll get it. So our format this afternoon will be, um, Richard is going to give us a presentation. I will disappear. Um, and I am coming to you from Marywood University School of Architecture, located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the hometown of Jane Jacobs. So I will be gone for about 35 minutes. Richard will give us an amazing presentation. I'll pop back on and we will take questions and Richard will answer them. So we'll, and if anyone has questions during the chat, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section of this um, conversation. Richard, it's all you, take it away. And I will see you in 35 minutes or so. Okay, Maria, do, do we have my full screen up on your oh. screen? Um, I don't think so. Try now. Not, not yet. No, let's try again. Let's try again. Yeah, let me, I'm at, uh, oh, up there is share screen. Let's try it again. Sure. You'll get it. Well, I'm clicking on it and it doesn't want to go. Is, uh, is somebody hmm. denied me the, ah, there it is. This will do it, go. I'm sure. You're perfect. And now, it? yep, it's great. And let's do full screen and then I'm out of here. There All we right. are. That's what we're okay. looking for. All right. See you in a bit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let me we'll get rid of the. Uh... Yeah. So anyhow, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. And because this is coming um, to you all um, from Scranton, Pennsylvania, hometown of Jane Jacobs, um, I can't resist um, putting a Scranton twist on, on this presentation. And um, uh, I was at a play that just opened in New York recently called uh, Straight Line Crazy. And it's a play about Robert Moses. And it of course plays off the, uh, the conflict that, uh, that Robert Moses um, had with Jane Jacobs. Play begins with a um, uh, monologue by the, the Robert Moses uh, character. And then suddenly very stridently, up walks this very purposeful uh, actress playing uh, Jane Jacobs, and she stands on the edge of the stage and looks out at the audience, very sophisticated New Yorkers. I actually saw it in London, big sophisticated crowd. And she says, so here I am, Jane Jacobs, 
you might wonder what I'm doing in a play about architecture. What would I know about architecture? I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Well, I thought, gosh, there's some mythology going on here because I have been through Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, and in fact, I heard a presentation on Jane Jacobs' childhood uh, at the very building where Jane went to high school. Um, still in use today, never demolished, wonderful building. Uh, there's a library right across the street from it that, that's perhaps even more majestic than this. And I thought, I think Jane knows an awful lot about architecture. So, um, so I'm here today to try to uh, clear away some of the mythology about Jane Jacobs and also about William H. White um, and propose to you that by learning about White, uh, we actually end up appreciating Jane even more than, um, than we already do. Um, so they're, they're both important figures in the field of urbanism. Uh, they both thought a lot about the institutional landscape, as it turns out, as well as the physical landscape. Both, as we'll see at the end of this, Jane and Holly both thought a lot about how organizations uh, can empower us uh, or hold us back. And I think the, these considerations are, are really critical in the uh, discussion of, of urban planning and urbanism in general. Um, here's a couple of snapshots that, uh, that, that help create the mythology of, of Jane and, and Holly. Holly, is, his middle name was Hollister, Hollingsworth, and uh, the nickname of, of Holly. So we have Jane and Holly, and here's a few snapshots. Um, Jane in the 1960s protesting the uh, imminent dem demolition of Penn Station. That's the uh, eminent architect, uh, Philip Johnson on, her, on the right side of that picture. Jane's in the middle there. Um, here she is in 1968. She's, she's on, the, on the right. And uh, that's uh, the, the uh, social critic Susan Sontag um, with her. And they are both together in a, uh, basically a lockup of the New York Police Department. They had been arrested um, for doing, uh, for, for protests in the Vietnam War. Now, just to build that, that mythological contrast between Holly and, Holly and Jane, Jane is there on the street. She's not just eyes on the street, she's actually protesting on the street. So at the same time, what kind of uh, activity is Holly taking? Well, he's, he's viewed as this patrician uh, public intellectual, uh, Princeton University, grew up supposedly in a wealthy Philadelphia suburb. Um, and here he is fighting the system. Um, this is at the White House. Holly is on the uh, on the right. Second from the left is Lawrence Rockefeller, uh, pretty well-heeled guy. And of course, Linda Johnson uh, is there in the middle, and they're um, they're doing some lobbying in their in their own way. Um, but in fact, I would like to to suggest that their backgrounds are are remarkably similar, uh, Whites and Jacobs. Um, um, so all of you from Scranton might recognize bits and pieces of your city that remain. This is, this is Scranton in 1916, the year of Jane's, um, Jane's birth. And uh, it was a bustling, dynamic town. And, and um, if you go back to Scranton today, um, you will be amazed, as I was, at how many buildings remain from the glory days of Scranton. Perhaps uh, I've heard one explanation that Scranton just didn't have the money to opt into a lot of these urban renewal projects. Well, uh, thankfully that was the case because a lot of the, the nice buildings remain. Um, White grew up in a somewhat similar town, economically diverse, uh, but much, much smaller than Scranton. He grew up in the little town of Westchester, um, Pennsylvania. It's about 25 miles southwest of Philadelphia. Um, it's got a, had about 12,000 people. Um, it was totally walkable. The whole town was, I think, one mile, basically one mile square on each side. And it was a big deal when the, when the Warner Brothers uh, movie theater opened in 1930. Um, and White was about 13 years old then. Um, and he could, he could walk. Uh, so the walkable downtown was um, ingrained into, into White from an early age. Um, in school, they were remarkably similar. Here at, 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 at Scranton Central, Jane, as it points out, uh, didn't make the honor roll, 
Um, in fact, she never came close. But um, as her mother said, uh, getting Jane through high school was, was an accomplishment. Um, now, now White went to while well, he went to a private prep school. Um, it was one that accepted students uh, with financial aid, and White may well have availed the White family may have availed themselves of some of that um, financial aid. But he got there, and he was fish out of water. There's there's White uh, as an eighth grader. Um, and he, he re remembered later that as a latecomer and the smallest and newest boy at the school, it was only natural uh, that they should beat me and beat me. Um, and of course, being at, at a prep school, White did uh, gather some uh, air of sophistication, a, a bit of a debonair look about him. Here he is in his senior year. Um, but looks can be deceiving. And uh, our boy Holly here, um, was came in 10th in his class rankings, out, uh, which might have sounded good, but the trouble is there are only 12 kids in the class. And his marks were terrible. He never made the honor roll, for sure. And his headmaster um, wrote a long essay ex explaining why um, White should be admitted to, to Princeton. Uh, and uh, the, the, the takeaway line was this, an unusually brilliant boy whose temperament is such that he can scarcely be classified in the ordinary way. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, there were probably teachers of, of Jane who had a similar feeling about her. So after um, St. Andrew's School in, in Delaware, White went to Princeton, he, ma he majored in English. Um, and after four years, um, if you think that he's the wealthy, uh, wealthy son of some uh, wealthy person in, in Philadelphia, uh, after four years, 1939, the height of the Depression, uh, White goes off uh, and, and starts selling Vicks VapoRub um, in the eastern hills of Kentucky. This is not a job that a typically wealthy Princeton uh, graduate would take on, not even in 1939. But I think White had to have a job. And uh, it is no wonder, perhaps, that when he got the chance to uh, enlist in the Marine Corps, in the fall of 1941, uh, two full months before Pearl Harbor, he jumped at the chance. And here he is um, in 1942. He's been, he's been now in the Marines for um, almost a year, not quite. And he gets shipped out and joins the amphibious landing at Guadalcanal. Um, and, and this was a place of, of true combat. Uh, it was not just a military exercise. This was the real thing. And White is standing uh, in the back row. He's on the right. Um, so um, in the Marines, and here he is again, see, seated now, and he's in the center row. In the Marines, White was a, an intelligence officer, uh, which basically meant that he supervised the lookouts. He was a lookout. He tried to figure out where the Japanese were how they were moving about and so on and where they could attack them uh, and so on. And after two years of this, um, White returned to the States um, and was assigned to the Marine Corps Training Center at Quantico, uh, where he instructed uh, new recruits and also wrote articles for the Marine Corps Gazette. Um, White's pieces for the Gazette are, are what we might now call long form journalism. Um, they were on subjects such as observation techniques, um, turning information into intelligence uh, and the art of adjusting, adjusting plans under changing circumstances. By the end of the war, he had a very impressive set of clippings that he was able to show the editors of Fortune magazine, um, which at the time was one of the preeminent national magazine, national publications. Um, uh, and, and White got the job and um, he brought with him to that job, he brought with him ideas from the Marine Corps about how individuals uh, relate to the organizations around them, uh, and, and also how people relate to the physical space around them. Uh, at Fortune, um, White began to take an interest in, in business communications and how people communicated to other, to the people around them. And in 1952, he coined the word groupthink. And, um, here, the emphasis is, is more on group than it is on think, but it's a, uh, he defined it as a rationalized conformity, um, an open, 
particular philosophy, which holds that group values are not only expedient, but right and good as well. And I have to say from my own personal experience today, I've been in meetings where people walk out and we're all sort of on the same page and we, we agree with the course of action. Uh, and the fact that we all agree somehow um, makes us think perhaps incorrectly or correctly, makes us think that that course of action is somehow better than the one that was uh, uh, more controversial. Not sure that's always true. So at Fortune, while most of America was, was marveling at the rise of the big corporations, this is the year of the post-war baby boom. Um, corporations were rising and becoming important, uh, important economic drivers of our social system. Um, suburban lifestyle was, was uh, coming into being. The Interstate Highway Act was, was facilitating the growth of the suburbs. Um, most people looked at this as a great thing. Uh, White and his um, other um, editors at Fortune uh, saw some unintended consequences. Um, so White's book, The uh, Organization Man, and this is a first edition, a tattered first edition version of it, um, came out in late 1956. It was on the bestseller list for um, most of, almost all of 1957. Sold millions of copies. Um, just recently was translated into Chinese. Um, and in this book, White defined what he called the social ethic. And that's this alluring, but um, also sometimes stifling bond between the individual uh, and the group surrounding him. He had witnessed this in the Marine Corps. He saw it in the, uh, in the corporations that he was studying at Fortune. Um, and he realized, that, um, he realized that this group harmony that everybody was in favor of um, was, was not always the right way to go. Um, group harmony, as he said, um, is not an unmixed blessing. Uh, progress sometimes is dependent on producing frustrations and tensions. Um, make, making everybody happy at the end of the day doesn't necessarily mean that you had a very productive day. Um, he, also, uh, he also identified something that he called scientism. Um, and by that, he meant um, people taking, um, establishing rules and regulations that seem to be based on science, um, but more often really based on guesswork and intuition, sometimes just pure guesswork. Um, he noticed it cropping up in a number of fields. Most, um, most importantly for him, most dramatically for him was the, the, the new field of human relations. Um, People, experts are coming in and saying, we've got these psychological tests. We can give you a psychological test um, that will tell you exactly what kind of an organization you should go with. Organizations could rely on these tests to hire people. And uh, White was, uh, was very skeptical of this. Um, and um, he quoted this um, uh, human resource person um, from an industry trade journal. This was written in 1953, and White quoted this, uh, this guy, this man, in, uh, in, his, in his book, The Organization Man. While industry does not ignore, ignore the brilliant but erratic genius in general, prefers its men, and this is a man's world back in the, in the 1950s, prefers its men to have normal personalities. So it was at about this time that White, um, uh, meets up with Jane Jacobs. And um, you wonder what these men would think of, um, of, of somebody, somebody uh, uh, who rides to, to work on a bicycle. Uh, when that somebody is a woman, you wonder, uh, you wonder even more. Uh, these guys on the corner are giving this lady a, a skeptical look as she chugs along up some avenue toward midtown Manhattan. Um, but in this case, uh, the woman on the bike um, turns out to be a very formidable figure indeed. And there's, there's Jane Jacobs um, off her bike now and getting ready to go to work. Um, so Jane, um, contrary to the mythology that some have, that she was this Greenwich Village housewife and looked out her window and, and saw this uh, fabulous sidewalk ballet um, unfold before her eyes. And, and Jane was, by the, in the 1950s, an accomplished journalist, um, she had a lot of experience. She had written um, at, 
Time Inc. for a magazine called Architectural Forum, which did, almost never gave out bylines. So she was largely unknown. And, and in this context, um, in, in 1956, Harvard University was planning a big conference on this new field of, of urbanism. And um, they invited the editor of Architectural Forum, a guy named Doug Haskell, to come and be a presenter. Um, for a variety of reasons, Doug didn't want to go. So he said, well, I've got another guy who can go. He turns to this other man and he says, no, I, I can't make it either. I don't want to go up there. Um, and so uh, Haskell said, well, hmm. There is this Jane Jacobs. How should I, how should I pitch this? And I think this uh, this letter of introduction that Doug Haskell sends to the people at um, at Harvard is pretty um, is pretty telling of just what what kind of an environment Jane was uh, was operating in and how much uh, uh, probably extra energy and skill she had to have to uh, to thrive in it. Uh, Haskell knew that another woman, one other woman, was going to be at this conference, so he wrote this note. Another woman would not be out of place, might I suggest, the substitute be Mrs. Robert Jacobs. Uh, I find it interesting that he identified her as Mrs. Robert Jacobs. I suspect that uh, he just threw out Jane Jacobs uh, and people did not realize she was a married woman. They think some single woman is coming up to Harvard. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, what would that lead to? Um, but she got there and, and urban renewal was, a, was the hot topic. Um, Jane talked about uh, uh, how some long established, even some ragtag neighborhoods uh, kept offering opportunities that the new housing projects uh, that were being put up did not. Well, she cited in, in particular an existing neighborhood in East Harlem uh, with a brand new housing project nearby. Um, and the East Harlem neighborhood worked, the new housing project did not work. And she said, she advised her audience, respect strips of chaos that have a weird wisdom of their own. The out of the ordinary um, things, weird wisdom um, was something that Jane, like Holly, um, appreciated throughout their entire lives. Well, this work at Harvard got the attention of White back in New York. And he asked Jane to contribute an article to a series that he was writing on the exploding metropolis, he called it. Um, this project addressed another unexpected consequence of the 1950s corporate boom, um, the unintended consequences of those suburbs and the, the interstate highway system that was, uh, that was being developed. And once again, um, Fortune recognized it, it early. Um, so in this series of, art, a series of magazine articles, which became a book published that same year, 1958, um, White edited the book and he wrote the introduction and two of the chapters. Um, Jane wrote a chapter called uh, Downtown is for People. Um, and I have to say, if, I, if somebody told me I could pick one book on urbanism and one book only and, and help people to read that as an introduction to the field, I would start with this little book from 1958. Um, and what's amazing about it is how many things, how many observations made in 1958 uh, continue to be the pressing problems of cities today. Uh, I'll just pick two here. Um, one quote from the book, more and more, it would seem, the city is becoming a place of extremes, a place for the very poor or the very rich or the slightly odd. And um, here in my hometown, we're, we're seeing that bifurcation uh, go, off the, go off the charts. Um, there's actually not even that much room for the slightly odd anymore. Um, but uh, it's, it's the very, very rich and increasingly richer who are settling in town and afford to. Um, at another point, the, books, the book points out, and this is again, 1958, redevelopers have planned for the driver rather than, than the pedestrian. Uh, how, how, how true it is. So Jacob's chapter, um, Downtown is, is for People, um, was noticed by the Rockefeller Foundation, which at that time was, was hoping to sponsor some writing on this, this new field of study. Um, and they, they approached uh, Jane, they approached her editor at uh, Architectural Forum. Jane indicated she would be very interested. However, she had never written a book before. She wanted to be able to take time off from work. Uh, she had three kids at home. Um, 
no, hardly any child care at the time. She would need, need some, some money. And uh, she was hoping for an advance of, uh, or not an advance, but a grant to underwrite this of uh, $10,000 which in those days was about $85,000 today. So it was, a, it was a big chunk of money. And uh, White went to bat for her and, and, um, and wrote a note to the Rockefeller people saying, asking for, for the money and saying, I believe the result may prove to be one of the great contributions to the whole field of urban planning and design. She got the money, she charged ahead. And about one year later in the summer of 1959, she still wasn't done, that she felt she was a long ways from being done. She needed more money. And uh, sheepishly perhaps went to White, um, but White always sees, sees things as um, half full, not as half empty. So he wrote another note to the Rockefellers. Um, and to, rot, to, to, rot, to White, this news that she isn't done yet is good news. This isn't bad news. He says, quite frankly, I was happy to hear that she wants to spend more time on the book. I wholeheartedly recommend the additional assistance for the extra time she wants to give the book. I believe a great and influential book is in the making. So Jane gets another $8,000, another, yeah, another $8,000, another big chunk of change. So book comes out and of course launches Jane's career and, and soon puts her into the uh, uh, into the uh, annals of, of, of urbanism as uh, probably the number one urbanist of our day. And uh, there it is, the Holly White, who had more to do with this book at a crucial stage than he probably realizes. And uh, this, this, uh, this book was found in Holly's uh, uh, bookshelves toward the end of his life. Uh, by a, a, an agent, an editor who was working with him and uh, fortunately wrote it down. The book itself uh, disappeared along with, uh, along with Holly's other belongings after he, after he died. So this is the first important book that came out of the, uh, the Exploding Metropolis and the one that everybody uh, remembers. Um, but another book um, came out, another important book came out and uh, it was written by White. The, the White's chapter in the uh, Exploding Metropolis that caught the attention of many people was on urban sprawl. And this is the photograph that uh, went with that story. Um, here's a, 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 a farmstead in the Brandywine Valley of Pennsylvania, not far from where Holly grew up in Westchester. And if you look in the, on the horizon there, above the farm and the barn, there is a row of developer houses and the parade of, of the avalanche of, of, uh, of development homes is coming toward the farm. And, and this image captured the attention of a lot of people. Um, and White ended up spending most of the 1960s working about, working about what started out to be the preservation of open space in the, um, in, in the countryside. And what he soon realized was um, had to also consider the urban landscape in the cities. And, and his contention was that if you could make the cities more livable, if you could utilize the uh, unused spaces in the, in the urban landscape, uh, there were great opportunities for, uh, for development without spreading out into the countryside. You, you lessen the pressure on the, on the countryside um, and you, you uh, intensify the uh, development downtown. So, um, all this work brought White to the attention of the New York City Planning Commission. And here's, here's the, uh, the last landscape. Um, this book published in 1968 uh, came, brought White to the attention of the New York City Planning Commission, which at that time was under growing pressure to write a master plan for the city of New York. Um, the uh, uh, federal funding, uh, was not being given out to cities that didn't have a master plan. New York had not had one. Um, and so now was the time to write one. And the people behind it wanted somebody who could write a, um, write a plan that would, be, uh, uh, that would be readable. So they picked, they picked white. And out came this, um, this plan, 17 inches by 17 inches. This is one of six volumes. Uh, the entire plan ended up weighing about 27 pounds. Um, 
it was radical in many ways. Um, it advocated for, among other things, what we now know as congestion pricing. Uh, this is a big controversy in Manhattan today. Um, in 1969, this plan said, we've got to start charging more for the spaces uh, where people most want to drive their, their cars. Um, otherwise, they'll just keep driving in and keep choking the streets. Um, it embraced density. Uh, White raised the issue of crowded sidewalks and said, to some observers, this concentration of activity is what is most wrong. But concentration is the genius of the city. We are not afraid of the bogey of high density. Now, um, like a lot of things in the 60s, um, it ended up being somewhat ignored in the 1970s, uh, but not all of it was forgotten. And in doing this research, White discovered an incentive that had been started in the 1960s, early 1960s by New York to give developers extra um, lucrative high, extra floor area ratio space uh, on the highest, on the upper floors of their buildings in exchange for some uh, privately owned public open space down at the base of the building. So if you, if you, if you put four or 5,000 square feet of uh, um, open space down at, your, at the base of the building that the public could sort of enjoy, we'll let you build a couple of extra floors up top and you can rent them at highly uh, lucrative rates. Well, Holly began to look into this and asked, well, what, what are those open spaces like? Um, and he, uh, he discovered that they really weren't very amenable to the public at all. Um, here's one right here. Um, a few people hung out there, but it was mostly uninviting. Uh, he discovered other, other spaces that were actually padlocked, so the public couldn't even, uh, couldn't even get in. And he realized that the public basically, as he said, the public was being had. Um, and so he went to the uh, director of planning, for, head of the planning board at New York, a guy named Don Elliott, and pointed this out to him. And Elliott said, well, to fix that, we'd have to fix zoning. Um, and um, fixing zoning is a lot of work. And you're going to have to really um, uh, go to work and, and come up with the specifics of how, how that would happen. So, um, so White had never been trained for anything like this before. Um, he was not a sociologist, not an architect, not an urban planner, an English major. Um, but as he said, he'd been at Guadalcanal. He'd done observation um, and, and uh, careful observation, and combat conditions. And he said, if he can do it at Guadalcanal under fire, enemy fire, he could do it in the streets of New York. And so, uh, so White assembled a group of interns. They first he called it the Street Life Project, then it became known as the uh, project for Public Spaces, um, which is still in operation today. And, uh, and White went about observing uh, public open spaces, try to see what made some work and what made others not. So here he is. He's down on the, right down at the sidewalk level, um, trying to be uh, uh, not too conspicuous. Here he is also filming away, trying again, trying not to let the, the camera uh, upset the, the normal actions of the people on the street. And, uh, and trying to figure out what made things work and what, what didn't make things work. Um, he kept looking for a secret sauce. There must be some mystery element here. And ultimately, he realized it was not a secret sauce at all. It was really something that was right in front of all of us. Um, if only we would look. For example, why, why do some places have more people sitting there than other places? And it was typically because they had more places for people to sit. Not an intellectual bombshell, as, as Hollywood would say. Um, so all of this work came together in a book and a movie by the same name, and that is The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Uh, here's another great reference book for people getting into the urban uh, urban planning thing. Um, and in the book, he sort of outlines what are the things that make a successful public space. And he, he comes up with a list of uh, criteria. We have sitting space. In fact, he always emphasized movable chairs um, because then people have control over, over exactly where they can sit. Sun, trees, water, always nice. Food, Triangulation, that's where two people come together and, 
and prompted by some third person or some third thing, end up talking to each other as if they were long lost friends. And in fact, they never met each other before. Um, and I have to say that during COVID, um, a lot of people in the suburbs came to really value public open spaces and a lot of triangulation was taking place. Um, it was very eye-opening for some people. Um, but Holly was the first one to admit that it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't rocket science. And yet, it's amazing how often to this day it doesn't happen. Um, I dropped into New York a couple of months ago, went by the new Moynihan train hall. Um, wonderfully repurposed building. They did not demolish the old post office in Manhattan. They turned it into this wonderful train hall. But as you can see, um, they, missed the, they missed the part of the memo about seating. Um, and yet, White would be delighted. And I think Jane also, I think, at the workarounds that people came up with. Note the woman over by the escalator. Um, and here's a woman enjoying lunch. Um, as again, found a, found a wonderful um, piece of uh, movable chair. And in fact, in both of these cases, the movable chair is also portable. Uh, they can take their suitcase with them and, uh, and, always, and always have a place to sit. Um, as, as, as White wrote, it's difficult to design a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. And they, uh, they managed uh, to do it again in, um, in New York and, and elsewhere. So what White also realized was that you, when, even when spaces are created that do work, um, you've got to become a steward of them. You've got to, you've got to be careful that, that you get what you were promised and then that you keep it. Um, he said, uh, most incentive zoning ordinances are very specific as to what the developer gets, but they get mushy in terms of what the public can expect later on. Well, if you go to New York today, you'll see signs like this that identify public open spaces. And these are all uh, inspired by white. Uh, they're very specific. That's not mushy at all. That's 24 chairs with four tables. And if you can go in there and count and see a short shortage, there's a phone number you can call. Uh, same thing with this one. Um, we've got uh, six Bradford pear trees, one drinking fountain, and 142 movable chairs. So, um, so they're ready. And you may think this is not a big accomplishment, um, but in fact, um, here's, here's what, what, what you run into if you go out to San Francisco. You think San Francisco would be way ahead of New York in this regard, but not so. They never had a, never had a Holly White um, riding herd on their public open spaces. This wonderful park, Redwood Park, is open for the enjoyment of our employees, tenants, and friends. Well, the general public is, in fact, uh, allowed to go in there. Um, so I guess we all count as friends. Um, this other place gives you the stern notice. You've got a right to pass, but it's by permission and subject to control of owner. Hmm. So um, even here in Princeton, um, I asked the little public space. There's no sign of welcome at all. There is this sign. I asked the director of planning if, if this was public space or not, and it took him a while to answer the question. And finally, um, he finally decided that yes, it was. Um, so Jane and Holly, um, no horseplay. That should be a telltale that somebody is trying to keep the, keep the public out. Um, in any case, both Holly and Jane emphasized the value of the layman in, in making sure in, in, in urban planning, um, and, and making sure that public spaces were, um, were appropriately uh, minded. Um, and, and they both saw the limitations and, and sometimes the failings of the institutions that we think will take care of us. Um, in the 1980s, um, White um, uh, published his book, his last book, City Rediscovering the Center. Um, and in that book, he cited the example of a new building going up on Fifth Avenue. It was, it was replacing an 11, story uh, department store, Bonwick Teller, um, and was gonna replace it with a much taller one. And the developer, as was usual, was getting a substantial bonus for creating a privately owned public space at the bottom. Um, but the bonus application required um, that the applicant answer several questions. Um, um, 
will the project change the demand for municipal services such as police, fire, sewage? Well, the developer's architect checked the box off. No, you know we're building a 58-story building here, but no, it won't. It won't make any impact on municipal services. Um, that seems preposterous. Um, and down the line, every at every question, the the, the architect, uh, the developer's architect said, "No, no problem, no problem, no problem." Um, and White marveled at this and, and was a little, little astonished. They said, "There's no evidence that any independent investigation was ever made of these matters." Um, nobody even looked at what what impact the building might have in terms of shadows that might be cast. Instead, the the city's review board said nothing. Um, and its final determination simply said the project would have no significant effect on the environment. Um, Holly found that kind of remarkable, but nonetheless, um, the building went up and, um, and there it is today. Um, and, and by the way, the, the, uh, Holly presented this uh, story in 1988 with absolutely no, um, no remarkable um, commentary on the owner of this particular building. In, in the 1980s, Trump was just another another New York developer, and he was take just another guy um, taking advantage of uh, incentives that were offered, and an increasingly lax um, review process. Um, so, in the final chapters, decades of her life, um, Jane began to look at institutional surroundings, uh, and she, like White, was increasingly troubled by what she saw. Um, and, 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 and these, the, the, these concerns are, are come out in some of her final books. Um, in Jacob's 1992 book, Systems of Survival, um, uh, one of her characters in this book is written sort of a fictional form. One of the characters warns about seeking harmony, being a false lead, and that, um, and that certain procedures may, may, for some people, help substitute uh, for the individual conscience. In other words, somebody would look at a procedure and say, well, I'll just follow the procedure and I don't have to worry about it. It's all very reminiscent of White's Organization Man from 1956. Um, in her final book, 2004, Dark Age Ahead, uh, Jane took note of a, uh, of a uh, heat wave that went through Chicago in 1995. Um, a thousand people or so died um, and the CDC sent in a group of about 80 researchers, and they decided that the people who died were the people who didn't follow the instructions from the CDC. Um, and and uh, one researcher, a guy named Eric Kleinenberg, who at that time was only a young graduate student in sociology, became famous later on. Um, Eric Kleinenberg went back and looked at the people and looked at the data more carefully. Uh, and he found that, that the predominance of deaths was in a part, was in a neighborhood in which there was no street life. Um, there was little, very little public, there were no public spaces, very uh, few mixed use blocks. The people on the other side of town um, who were also affected by the uh, heat, the heat wave, similar economic background, but they had stores, street fronts, they were more trusting of strangers, they got out in public more. They actually got more of the uh, message than uh, uh, than the other people did. Um, so, to me, I thought, ah, Jane will say this is a this is a case study, and I told you so moment of what she wrote about in um, Death and Life of Great American Cities, the value of the of the uh, eyes on the street, the mixed use neighborhoods, um, retail mixed in with residential, and so on, the organic city. Um, but instead, Jane derived a totally different lesson from this tragedy, um, and it's one that could have come out, could have been cited by, by White in the organization man. Um, she asked about these 80 CDC researchers. Um, she wondered if any of them were potential planning birds, people who might have looked at the data in a different way. And if so, if they had looked at it in that way, why didn't they object? at the inappropriate investigative strategy, would they have been regarded as pariahs and troublemakers? Again, reminiscent of, of White's uh, groupthink and, and the quest for harmony. Was it pervading the CDC? Now, as I move toward the end of this whole presentation, um, I, I should note that the CDC lately has come under uh, uh, attack from, from uh, a certain part of our political spectrum. Um, 
And so we wonder if, uh, I wonder, would Jane endorse this black blanket condemnation of the CDC and its scientific findings? Um, and it's important to note, to, to note how Jane defined um, this inquiry and how she defined the role of change and how it should come about. Um, she talked about uh, how to bring about, a, uh, how, to, how to remove an old paradigm, an existing paradigm. And this is what she wrote in 2004. Um, uh, the obsolete paradigm must give way discredited by the real world. Um, but she said, the outworn paradigms ordinarily stand staunchly. And I think this is the important part. If somebody comes up with a leap of insight, imagination, and courage, sufficient to dislodge it and replace it. So I will, uh, I will let you decide um, whether or not the recent attacks on the CDC have come with uh, insight, imagination, and courage. Um, if, if, if Jane were, were, were taking on the CDC, uh, I would imagine large quantities of all that. Now, so, so we have Jane's view. Now it turns out Holly wrote a very similar, addressed the very similar subject uh, 51 years before that in a, in a sermon of all things that he gave to a church on the Upper East Side of New York in 1952. And this was White's feeling. Every great advance has come about and always will because someone was frustrated by the status quo. White talks about skepticism, questioning, and curiosity, which, to borrow a phrase, blows the lid off everything. And I'd ask that question again. Um, would White think that the current attacks on the CDC are, are, are being exercised with skepticism, questioning, and that kind of curiosity? Um, he, he might not. Um, as Jane said in a, in a, in a 2001, um, interview with James Howard Kunstler, who's written frequently on urbanism. Um, she and Holly were friends from the beginning. He was one of the few people that she looked up when she would go back to New York. Um, she and Holly, Jane said, were on the same wavelength. Um, so um, I look at these pictures, and I think this is sort of the way the, the, the mytho mythological view that we have of Jane. There she is probably putting an evil eye on that big housing development behind her. Could even have been something that was brought up by uh, Robert Moses. There's Holly enjoying the bustle of, um, of Midtown Manhattan. Yet on a, on a final note, um, and it's, and I noted only for the irony, uh, maybe nothing more than an ironic moment, um, for Jane, the champion of those sidewalks in Greenwich Village, uh, her final resting place is a cemetery in the town of Espy, Pennsylvania. I believe it's a population of about 1,700. It's about 50 miles southwest of Scranton. And for Holly, who was once asked to name his three favorite cities, and his answer was New York, New York, and New York, um, Holly is buried in Oakland Cemetery, which is in a, a wooded area uh, on the outskirts of Westchester, Pennsylvania. So the myth and the reality. And uh, on that note, I will pass it back to uh, uh, Maria, if I can. Hi, uh, I'm here. Hi there, Thank Maria, you. yeah. Thank you, Richard, so much. Oh, there you go, stop share, perfect. That so was we, so interesting. I have a couple of Q and A's for you. Let's see how much time we have left, about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so let's talk, let's see this one first. This came in, um, you know, uh, the question about, could you comment on White's influence on the revival of Bryant Park from Ronald Gross? Yeah, um, I, I gave a presentation at Bryant Park um, um, over the summer and it was, it was terrific. It, was, it, it is a wonderful, welcoming space. Um, and, it, and it was not always. And, and the, what, what Holly White did when he was shown the problem, um, and he had experienced it himself, he was afraid to walk into it back in the 1970s. Um, it had been sort of, the design of it was to raise it up above the street level. Remember, we talked about the elements of a successful mm -hmm. public space. Mm -hmm. One of them is the street. And Bryant Park was, was designed back in the 1920s, I believe the redesign came about. 
and it raised it and elevated it and made it removed from the street. So White said, the key thing that he said was, let's, let's make it more visible from the street. Let's open up some of the entrances that are now very narrow. Let's make them really wide. Um, let's make the steps more gradual and um, let people come in, in there and, and, and basically let, let the regular decent people of New York come in and the homeless and the disaffected and the drug dealers and so on will actually feel threatened by the regular people instead of the other way around. And that's what happened. It's been a great success. Great, thank you. I have a question from one of the architecture students here at Mary Wood University, Blair. Um, he asks, considering both the work of Jean Jacobs and William Holly White, what aspects or aspect do you feel have contributed the most to current public spaces? And he talks about like, for example, the base of the Seagram's building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Seagram's building was a space that, uh, that worked <clears throat> despite itself. Um, the, 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 the plaza was actually designed um, by Philip Johnson and uh, mm -hmm. Mies van der Rohe um, as a pedestal for their great building. They, they really didn't expect people to hang out there, but um, it, it, it was a testament to, and I think it's one thing that, that's a takeaway from both Jane and Holly, um, that, that things re that people relate to spaces um, in ways that, that we can't always um, design and that uh, we should take our cues from the way they really actually use the space um, mm -hmm. rather than from our expectation of what they might do. Right, right. I have, um, great. I'm, I'm just reading through all these questions I have here. Um, this is from Nathan, another architecture student here. And he talks a little bit more about in, in smaller towns, how can we engage, in your opinion, our streetscapes more through the use of fixed chairs when we don't have movable seating? Well, we're really, yeah, we're really interested in seating. Um, what with our studies right now, we've been talking quite a bit about it in smaller towns. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in a town of uh, thirty thousand people, and right, uh, right. Yeah, and the, uh, the 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 one the the greatest public space right now, the one that's been used more than any other, uh, was for, was started about twenty years ago. It's right next to the library and. Uh, a couple of restaurants and behind the restaurants is hidden a parking garage. Um, but movable chairs are a big part of that. And, and of course, everybody predicted all the chairs would be stolen. Right, right. And, uh, you have to keep replacing them. That has not turned out um, to be the case. Um, I, I think maybe um, if, if you're stuck with non-movable chairs, um, maybe the key, first of all, is to see which ones get used more than others. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some way to, to install some other sort of um, um, landscape element mm -hmm. that, that could double as a, as a, as a chair. And yeah. uh, you don't have right. to make people come in with their suitcases like they do. Right, with, yeah. You know, that was probably home. one of my favorite uh, slides. <laughs> yeah, kind of sad. I have a question from Jacob. He's, th this is sort of on the same line. If we design these public spaces, how do we keep them from being destroyed, vandalized, or abandoned? So there's concern about you know, providing these public spaces and then having them be engaged or, or how do they become, how does the community take ownership of them and protect them in some way? Any thoughts on that with Holly or we're looking for work ideas on Jane and how the community then needs to take ownership of those spaces? Yeah. Well, as Holly said, people, people always like to go where there are other people and- um, right. The, the key is to, to, to program that space, even in a um, unofficial way, um, so that people are drawn to it and feel like they can stop and, and hang out. Um, it's, uh, I think the Bryant Park example is a good one, where the more that you can relate the space to the, to the street right near it, mm -hmm. keep it integrated with, with, with the, the pedestrians who are walking by, um, the better, the more used it's going to be, the more used it's going to be, the, the safer it's going to be and the, and the less likely it's going to be uh, vandalized. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'd recommend the thing that, that Holly and both Holly and Jane, mm -hmm. at different times in their life, had remarkably similar things that they said about planning. And they both, they mm -hmm. both said small plans, repeated often, started small, move 
plan, replan, move ahead. And, right. and, and uh, Holly, Holly saw elements of that in World War II at Guadalcanal. Um, and it, um, do, do the little thing and see how it works out and then do the little thing again and maybe make it a little bigger. Mm. Build mm. Nice. Okay, so this question probably will be our last one because it's going to be a little longer and it's a two-parter. This is coming from Lindsay, another one of our students here. So how has Jane Jacobs inspired you, Richard, um, mm -hmm. especially within you know, the urban setting? And then I would ask also, how has Holly inspired you with your work? So again, I think that's probably our closing talk, our closing answer or a question mm -hmm. and answer because this is how did, you know, on your perspective in your work. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 writing a lot about uh, urban things, and I'm I'm active on a group that uh, in in Princeton is trying to bring these issues to the public before they end up as a yes or no vote before the planning board. We're trying to initiate community discussion in advance, uh -huh. and and both Holly and Jane talked about the value um, of getting of getting the community involved sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. um, and and. Um, uh, well, I could go on and on about Jane, but 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 I know that um, one thing with one thing with White because his prescriptions, his his view, he simplified things so much that it was really that's really become impossible to go to a public space to walk around town without Holly. You feel that Holly's sort of hanging over your shoulder, mm -hmm. saying, "Hey, take a look at that. Take a look at that little corner park. There's one bench there." Does that bench ever get used? And if, right. if so, if not, why not? And 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 so the just opening the eyes to the uh, to the urban landscape, uh, whether it's in a, a big city or in in a very small town, um, is important. And I, I and I I take that away. And I think I think Jane's idea of the uh, sort of the the, uh, the living or the city as a living organ mm -hmm. organism. Mm -hmm. Also, um, is something that that, that's, that comes to mind, and uh, uh, I think both of them just really yep. inform the way you inform the way you look wherever you go. Perfect, perfectly said. Thank you. So, um, you know, we need have to conclude. Did you have uh, an offer or a conversation? Island Press, your publishing. We we're encouraging everyone to please check out the American Urbanist. There's a an offer, I think, right, that we wanted to talk about before we conclude. Yeah, I think that if you uh, if you go to the, if you want to order this book, you can get thirty percent off. Okay. Um, if you go to Island Press, and there, there's a place where you can put in a discount code, and the okay. word is webinar. So if you put there in we webinar in all caps, um, that Great. will. <laughs> That will so, get you 30% off. That's incredible. That's wonderful to know. So webinar in all caps at Island Press. All caps webinar. Mm -hmm. Well, I've already ordered mine, so I'm going to have to figure out another way to do that. But <laughs> I can't wait. Well, well, yeah, sorry about that. But, <laughs> no, uh, I'm kidding. Thank you. I, but I, I, I think that the future of, of, of urbanism is going to be in, in places, um, is going to be more in places that are in the suburbs. And uh, mm. I, I really think that, uh, you know, the lessons that the suburbs can take from the urban example um, mm -hmm. are really powerful lessons. And I, and I hope that people, even in small towns, mm -hmm. aren't put off by the, uh, by the language. You know, here in Princeton, they get frightened if you use the word density. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when right. You, when you look at density um, in actual terms, they look at you take a very dense project, um, show it to people, and if you told hey. them what the density was, they they freak out. Mm -hmm. If you say, "Here's the project," they say, "Wow, it's kind of nice." Agree. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. This is we're out of time, and thank you to yeah. Island Press. Thank you to Marywood University School of Architecture for partnering with us. Thank you for the Center for Living City visits. Our website, help sponsor more Jane Jacobs lectures, please. And, uh, you know, check out, we have another one coming up in November. We'll be posting it very soon from the Center for the Web, um, Living Cities website. And this video will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. Richard, thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Much appreciated.